Chapter 4 is about God the Father and the Spirit, particularly. Chapter 5 is about God the Son. Chapter 4 and 5 are stressing, uh, chapter 4 is stressing creation. Chapter 5 is stressing redemption. Both of them are teaching the sovereignty of God. So Mark will begin and we'll do six verses each coming along. After this I looked and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. <clears throat> and the voice I had first heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, well, Come up here and I'll show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the spirit and there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. And the one who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Carnelian, a rainbow resembling an emerald encircled the throne. Surrounding the throne were 24 other thrones, and seated on them were 24 elders. They were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings, and peals of thunder. Before the throne, seven lamps were blazing. These are the seven spirits of God. Also before the throne, there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. In the centre around the throne were four living creatures, and they were covered, covered with eyes in front and behind. The first living creature was, was like a lion, the second was like an ox, the third had a face like a man, the fourth was like a flying eagle. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around, even under his wings. Day and night they never stopped saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory, honour and thanks to him who sits on the throne and who, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worships him who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and say, You are worthy, O Lord and God, to receive glory and honour and power. For you created all things, and by, by your will they were created and have their being. <coughs> then I saw the right hand of him who sat on the throne, a scroll with writing on both sides, and sealed with seven seals. Thank you. Lester? And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, who was worthy to break the seal. Who was worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and have seven seals. Then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain standing in the centre of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. He had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out unto all the earth. He came and took the scroll from the right hand of him to set on the throne. Go ahead, Harvey. <laughs> and when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of their hearts, and golden vials full of odours, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and hast made unto us our God, kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. And I beheld, and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, and the beasts and the elders, and the number of them was ten thousand times ten thousand and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honour and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them heard I saying, Blessed. Blessing and honour and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. And the four beasts said, Amen. And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever. And that's the end of the chapter, is it? John is not seeing heaven itself, but a vision. There is not a bleeding lamb in heaven. 
there is our resurrected saviour who once hung on the cross there's not an expectant mother in heaven crying out these are pictures there's not a great red dragon in heaven so these are symbolic pictures not heaven itself but they reveal heavenly and earthly truths when it says in verse 1 come up hither dispensationalists who number many wonderful saints who were begun with the brethren who are great people I had F.F. F. Bruce as a tutor in Manchester he's probably the most well known brethren in the world but he wasn't an orthodox brethren but uh, he was a wonderful man he would take the garbage collector aside and talk to him about the gospel but dispensationalists whose theology has been popularised by the Schofield Bible which was edited by many men who were not dispensationalists and which has many good things in it teach the secret rapture the theory that the Christian church will be removed before the last great tribulation and taken to heaven Christianity Today, the foremost evangelical magazine in the world, has 44 editors. Not one of them believes in the secret rapture. Theologically, the doctrine is a dead duck. But thousands upon thousands of people still believe it. The church I go to regularly has a beautiful Christian man who was expelled from his church because he experienced a divorce from his brethren church and now attending another church and whenever I preach whenever I get out of line with dispensationalist doctrine uh, he makes me aware of the fact at the close but he does it in a very nice and Christian way my chances of converting him are nil (laughs) (laughs) oh yes they're less than nil (laughs) but I have hopes that the spirit of God may one day show him these things but they base a lot on these words come up hither they say that points to the fact of the Christian church being raptured up to heaven but there's no such thing because the church is described as living and though not well in chapter after chapter that follows the church is persecuted the church is witnessing so the secret rapture theory is oh, let me tell you how it started about 1830 a very godly young woman by the name of Margaret MacDonald was caught up in a charismatic revival in Scotland and began to have visions. Visions were very common in the 19th century. Very, very common. Harriet Beecher Stowe said every chapter in Uncle Tom's cabin came to her by vision. Different eras have different manifestations of the Christian spirit. It would be a mistake to say and that all these people that had visions were deceivers. They were not. But sometimes they mistook pious, thoughtful wanderings of the mind in times of meditation for something that was 100% supernatural. Sometimes that mistake was made. Now, Margaret MacDonald had a vision of the Lord coming and taking the church out before the last great tribulation. Edward Irving took hold of it, you remember he was the founder of a new church, New Jerusalem Church in England, a very famous name, Edward Irving. He stirred all of London. He had the great men of literature and the politicians, everybody coming to his church. But he began to teach the sinful nature of Christ and was expelled. There are whole denominations today that teach it and don't know that they're teaching a heresy. Very sad. So Edward Irving got it from Margaret MacDonald. And Schofield a man who'd been in jail as a criminal, who'd done all sorts of bad things, but who was truly converted and edited the famous Schofield Bible, he adopted it. And that Bible was scattered like the leaves of autumn right across America. I say America because in Europe, this idea is, is mocked, laughed, rejected. It's mainly an Americanism. Uh, everything very good and very bad comes out of America, so I'm not being negative not being negative, but the Schofield Bible was scattered over America 
And a lot of people in Australia have inherited because Australians love anything American. You know, they saved us World War II, we like the movies, and uh, if it's American, let's get on to it. Uh, and so even this aspect of American religion has been embraced by many in Australia, but it's not biblical. The place in the Bible that most describes the rapture is 1 Thessalonians 4, where it says, The Lord descended with a shout, the trump of God, the voice of the archangel. It's the noisiest chapter in the Bible. Nothing secret about it. That's the one that talks about the rapture. See, rapture means gathering up. I believe that. Secret rapture, the Bible knows nothing of it. So that's just a by the by in connection with the way some interpret this section. Uh, so John is having a vision, not of heavenly things themselves, but a vision of things that are to teach about heaven and earth. The main thing he sees is a throne. And God on the throne with a rainbow all around it. Most of the rainbows we see are partial. It's rare you see a complete rainbow. The rainbow, of course, is the sign of the covenant. And the rainbow is the mingling of sunshine and shower. And God, in God are found love and justice, mercy and righteousness. And this symbolism is trying to tell us that out of the essence of God we can find the explanation beginning now, complete only in heavenly times of everything that happens on earth. It's all connected with his reaction, the reaction of holiness, the reaction of love, the reaction of justice. If God had no justice, the world would not be at all secure. If God had no love, sinners could have no peace. But God is both just and merciful. He's both. As the rainbow has both rain and sunshine. And it's going to picture Christ in chapter 5 as a lion of the tribe of Judah. And when you turn to look at the lion, you see a lamb. And the Greek word anion means a little pet lamb. The only other times it's used is by John in his gospel, hope. All other New Testament writers use a different word, amnos. So the lion of the tribe of Judah turns out to be a little lamb. It is reminiscent of the symbolism of the Goel, G-O-E-L, which was the name of the kinsman redeemer. You read all about it in the book of Ruth. The Goel was the next of kin to someone who had died, who acted as the policeman if the person had been murdered, treated unfairly, but who also married the widow if it didn't interfere with his own inheritance. And he redeemed the property of the dead man, became his. So the Goel in Israel, the relative, the next of kin, acted the part of justice and of redemption. And the figure here of the lion and the lamb is to remind us that our Christ is a judge People have the idea that the Father is the judge and the Son is interceding. That's not true. Christ says in John 5.22, the Father judges no man. He's committed all judgment to the Son. He's our judge advocate. That's great, isn't it? We know the one who is a judge has had our flesh, walked in our world, had to deal with people. And you know, almost all our troubles don't come from famine and fire and pestilence. They come from people. And Christ has lived among people. And he's lived in poverty. And he's been despised and rejected of men. He's the judge. But he's not only the judge, he's the redeemer. So, to understand the gospel, we must keep in equal poise these two truths. God is holy. God is righteous. But God is love. God is mercy. They're both true. Right, so the next thing we see is this four, it says four beasts, that's a bad translation it's not the same word for beast you find Revelation 13 it means a living something living <clears throat> it means four living groups each with six divisions, six wings so there are 24 divisions here, presided over by 24 elders, that word is never used for angels 
These are human beings. They have stephanoi, not diadems. They have the victor's crown. They have white robes of the imputed righteousness. Where'd they come from? I would remind you that in the ancient temple, 1 Chronicles 24, says there were 24 courses of priests, thousands of them. 24 courses of priests in Solomon's temple, presided over by 24 elders. When our Lord died, according to Matthew 27, the rocks were rent, the graves were opened, and many of the saints that slept arose, went into the holy city, and appeared unto many. What next? What happened? Did they go back? No. Ephesians 4.8 says that when Christ ascended to heaven, he led a multitude of captives. You remember the Feast of First Fruits, when they took a sheaf out of the field before the harvest, that sheaf didn't just have one grain. It had lots of grains on it. Thousands of grains on it. And so when Christ rose as the first fruits of them that slept, he took with him a company of saints from Old Testament times to be his assistant priests in heaven above. So sometimes you may want to read that passage in chapter 27 toward the end of the chapter about the opening of the graves and the coming out of the saints and then compare it with Ephesians 4.8 and then look at this passage that uses the symbolism of the temple priesthood, the 24 courses. What about this lion Ox, man, and eagle. Well, you find the same symbolism in Ezekiel 1. And it's probably being alluded to in Numbers 2, where we find that Israel camped in cruciform style, like a cross, three tribes to the north of the temple, sanctuary in the wilderness, three to the south, three to the east, three to the west. Each three under a standard. And Numbers 2 talks about these four standards. Jewish tradition says the standards were a lion, an ox, a man, and an eagle. So, in a nutshell, we have here in symbolism the heavenly temple, Christ our great high priest, assisted, so to speak, by assistant priests, so that we might know that we're represented up there in our elder brother, our Redeemer, and many, many that were raised with him, as Matthew 27 clearly says, who are now his right-hand men, like the ancient multitude of priests under 24 elders of old. So I remind you again that when it talks about four beasts, it's the wrong word, it should be four living companies, six wings, six divisions, so there are 24 sections, presided over by 24 elders, and it's using the symbolism of the ancient camp of Israel with the tabernacle in the centre and three tribes north, three south, three east, three west. And it's assuring us that the heavenly temple is functioning on our behalf. We have representatives there. We're not alone. Some have made it. You know, what some have done, others can do. When I first became a Christian, I thought, boy, I don't think I can hold out at this. Too many don'ts and too many shalts. I didn't, wasn't happy with any of them. But I knew it was the only way to go. But would I, could I hold out? I can picture the thought coming to me so clearly. Can I ever hold out? That then I learned, if we do the coming, he will do the keeping. You know, the person that believes, no one can pluck them out of my hand, no one can pluck them out of the Father's hand. If you're a believer, you're between the hands of the Father and the Son. And no one can pluck you out. You can take yourself out because he'll never take you away your liberty. But neither men nor devils can pluck you out. That's the safest place in the universe. Read about it in John chapter 10. No one can pluck them out of my hand. No one. Paul is saying the same thing when he says, neither life nor death, nor things present, nor things to come, nor principalities or powers can separate me from the love of God. See, we all want to be loved. Without it, we have no worth. Without it, we'll be angry. We'll despair. No wonder the suicide of young people in Australia has gone up 400% in recent decades because we live in a post-Christian Australia. We've got to realise we are loved. We are precious. The hairs of our head are all counted. And we are forgiven. And we are accepted. And there's no condemnation. 
and he does not impute sin to us despite our failures and faults and sins he doesn't impute them so that's a picture of the heavenly sanctuary and based on the Old Testament pictures the seven uh, lamps are symbolic of the perfection of the Holy Spirit <coughs> You'll notice the doxology, the end of four, about glory and honour and power. The first doxology in Revelation is in chapter one, and there are two attributes. Look at it, perhaps. Look at chapter one for a moment. Verse six. To him be glory and dominion. That's the doxology, a prayer to God. To him be glory and dominion. Now in chapter four and verse eleven. Thou art worthy to receive glory and honour and power. Now it's three. Now look at chapter 5, verse 13, the last part. Blessing, honour, glory and power. Now it's four. Now look at chapter 7, verse 12. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honour and power and might be unto our God. How many now? Seven. So it's like the promises in the early chapters that grow. The doxologies are two, then three, then four, then seven. The more we see of God, the more we have to praise. So here's a picture of the sovereign God, humanity represented before him and those that rose from the grave with Christ. And it's trying to say to the saints, look, don't be afraid. You know, the main problem in life is not the facts, it's the fears. And we've all got them like a dog has fleas. We've all got them. Many of these fears are absolutely necessary. If we didn't have any fears, we wouldn't look to the left or the right crossing a road. Many of the fears are necessary, but every good thing's been exaggerated by the fall. Every good thing, natural desire for food, for sex, for possessions, every good thing God gave us has been exaggerated by the fall. And the protective fears have been exaggerated, so now we can fear our own shadow. It has been calculated the Bible has 365 fear knots. Not all in those two words, but they're equivalent. That's one for every day in the year. Fear not. Fear not. So this chapter is saying the saints, fear not. God's in control. You're represented up there. It's okay. Then we come to chapter 5. Our attention is drawn to the Redeemer, to Christ. And let's look briefly at chapter 5. First of all, something about the book. What's this book written within and on the back side sealed with several seals? Would you look with me at Jeremiah 32? Jeremiah 32. Sherry, would you read us verses 6 to 10 kindly? Jeremiah 32, <coughs> verses 6 to 10. We're asking the question, what is symbolised by the book sealed with seven seals, written within and without? Remember, everything in, the Old, everything in the book of Revelation comes from the Old Testament. In the book of Revelation, all the books of the Bible meet an end. Over 550 allusions to the Old Testament in Revelation. You must never try and interpret the Revelation by the newspaper or the history book. You interpret it by the Old Testament and by the Gospels. Thank you, Jerry. And Jeremiah said, The word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Behold, Hanfiel, the son of Shalom, thy uncle should come unto thee, saying, Abide in my field that is in Ammonon, for the right of redemption is thine to buy it. So Hanamiel, my uncle's son, came to me in the court of the prison, according to the word of the Lord, and said unto me, Buy my field, and I pray thee, that is in Ammonon, which is in the country of Benjamin, for the right of inheritance is thine, and the redemption is thine. Buy it for thyself. Then I knew that this was the word of the Lord. And I bought the field of Hanuel, my uncle's son, and that was in Enoch, and weighed him the money, and even seventeen shekels of silver. And I subscribed the evidence, and sealed it, and took witnesses, and weighed him the money in the balances. Thank you. Notice that last verse, how he takes a title deed and seals it. The idea in Revelation chapter 5 is that of a title deed to the lost inheritance of mankind. And the question is asked, 
Who can unseal this book? So the inheritance, the lost inheritance of earth can be restored to mankind. And John weeps because no one is found. And then he's told, don't weep. Look, there's the lion. There's the lion of the tribe of Judah. He can unseal the book. He's got the worth. He's got the strength. He's got the right. And John looks for a lion and he just sees a pet lamb. No one's scared of a lamb. If you went out in an African night in the jungle and something brushed against you, you'd be scared to death till you notice it was a lamb or something. See? No one's scared of a lamb. The lion is a lamb. This lamb becomes a lion winning by his meekness, by his humility, by his love, and by his sacrifice, he redeems the world and has the right to unseal the title deeds of the world and restore the world to his people. So that's the symbolism here. Title deeds which in ancient times were sealed and that when the property was going to be handed over, those seals were removed. We're going to move now into what happens when the seals are opened. Uh, In chapter 6, and could we continue reading please in chapter 6, would you kindly read to us the first six verses and then if you would continue. I saw when the lamb opened one of the seals, which I heard, and it was the noise of thunder. One of the four beasts sang, Come and see. And I saw and beheld the white horse, and he that sat on him, and a crown was given unto him, and he went to the conquering and the conquer. And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, Come and see. And there went out another horse that was red. The power was given to him that sat there on to take peace from him, and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see. And I held a black horse, and he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, Measure and weep for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny, and see that hurt not the oil and the wine. And now from verse 7. <clears throat> then he came and took the scroll out, out of the right hand. Uh, this is chapter 6, chapter 6 and verse 7. When he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of four, four, four living creatures saying, Come and see. So I looked and behold a pale horse, and the name of him who sat on him was death. And Hades followed with them, and power was given to them, to them over the fourth, over a fourth of the earth, to kill with the sword, with hunger, with death, and by the hosts of the earth, and the beasts of the earth. Then he opened the fifth seal, and I saw under the altar of soul, the souls of those who were slain for the word of God, and for the test, and for the test of which they fell. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord? Are they in trouble until he judged and avenged our blasts on those who dwell on the earth? Then a white robe was given to each of them, and it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer. And both number of their fellow servants and their brethren, who would be killed as they were, were completed. And I looked, and I looked when I opened the sixth seal, and behold, and behold, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became like blood. Thank you, Kevin. Would you finish the chapter? And the stars in the sky fell to earth, and late figs dropped, and the fig tree went shaken by a strong wind. The sky receded like a scroll, rolling up, and every mountain and island was removed from its place. Then the kings of the earth, the princes and the generals, the rich, the mighty, and uh, every slave and every free man hid in caves and among the rocks of the mountains. They call to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the rock of the Lamb, for the great day of their wrath has come. And who can stand? Thank you. <clears throat> now let's look at this, this chapter. Here's the unsealing of the book. These are the things that must happen before the lost inheritance of the world, lost by sin, is restored to the redeemed. And one of the key
keys to the study of this book comes from the name of the Bible itself, which in its subsidiary section is called the Old Testament and the New Testament, better translated the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. It's the same Greek and Hebrew words for covenant and testament. And so the first 39 books are the books of the Old Covenant, and the last 27 are the books of the New Covenant. And covenant imagery is very prominent throughout Revelation. We saw the rainbow of the covenant. That was a promise that God would always remember us even in trouble. Isn't it wonderful that after a storm there's a rainbow? God is saying, don't worry, I'm still sovereign. I'm in charge. I love you. See? Hope, hope springs out of the love of God. But the covenant also had woes. It had blessings for disobedience. It had blessings for obedience and curses for disobedience. And all God's laws are are reflections of his character. God's laws are a reflection of reality. To go against the law is like spitting into the wind. The world and the law of God are meant to go together like a railway train's wheels on on the uh, things made to receive it on the earth. Life commends what Christ commands. So the Bible is full of promises for the obedient and threats for the disobedient and the threats are as much the announcement of love as the promises. God threatens some things so they won't happen. Like 40 days and then it'll be overthrown. It wasn't. It was a threat to make them repent. So the Bible has lots of warnings that if we forget that the law of God and life on earth go together like the wheels of a train and the rails underneath it, like soil and seed, God warns us. You never really break the law, it'll break you. So the Old Testament had a cluster of woes and you find it all through the Apocrypha, Pseudepigrapha, their ancient Jewish books, as well as in both Testaments. And Christ summarised them when he talked about war and famines, pestilences, and before them all, persecution. Persecution, wars, famines, pestilences. These are known as the apocalyptic covenant woes. This symbolism here is based on those but it goes at a deeper level than the apparent. John was capable of several layers of meaning. He does it in his Gospel, Hope. John 12.32, uh, when the Son of Man is lifted up. There he meant lifted up on the cross, as Keith drew my attention to rightly some weeks back. But he also meant is being lifted up to glory. So here's something on two levels. Now, in chapter 6, under inspiration... John is saying, these are the things that must happen before the end of the world. <clears throat> before the world is given back to the redeemed saints of God. These are the things that must happen. And he is aware of what Jesus told him and the other disciples on the Mount of Olives. There will be persecutions. There will be wars. There will be pestilences. There will be famines, see? He takes that for granted. But he's going to a deeper level. So the first horse, white, Lucos, only ever used of heavenly things in the book of Revelation. Many commentators say this is a figure of Antichrist. That's nonsense. My wife says I'm not to use the word rubbish, so I'll say it's just nonsense. <laughs> it's nonsense. <laughs> white always is used as a symbol for the things of heaven right throughout this book. Things that are shiny, glorious. Christ has this white hair and so on. Uh, it's used over and over in this book. It's a quotation from Psalm 45, where God rides forth gloriously with a bow and arrows, punishing the wicked and redeeming the saints. You see, a horse is always a symbol of warfare. And that symbol in both Testaments. Christians are told to war a good warfare. War a good warfare. 
Fight the good fight. It's the fight of faith, which alone can energise us to oppose the evil, first of all in ourselves. Remember Dwight L. Moody, I've had more trouble with myself than any other man I've ever met. That's true of all of us, so you fight within yourself. You fight the good fight. So a horse is a symbol of warfare. And here is a glorious gospel symbolised by Christ on the white horse going forth conquering and to conquer. That's the same word as overcome in the Greek. When it adds and to conquer it means this is the true overcoming. <clears throat> it will reach into eternity. So the gospel goes forth conquering and to conquer but it meets with opposition. The second beast is the ox or the calf, the symbol of sacrifice. And in the second seal... A sword is used, and it's not the word for the sword in an army, it's the word for the sword in the hand of a priest to slay a sacrifice. So in the second seal, we have opposition to the gospel. I come not to bring peace. What's the rest of it? But a sword. See? There's no peace, says my God, to who? To the wicked. So when the gospel is presented, people are never the same afterwards. They're either much better or much worse. The same sun hardens clay, melts wax. The gospel makes the people better or worse. It never leaves them the same. If a church ever gets the gospel, look out for upsets. You know about that, Graham. Yeah. yeah. If a church ever gets the gospel, look out for upsets. Because a lot of the legalistic people will take umbrage. He's treating us as common sinners. Can't have that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> And so on, you see. So the second horse is talking about the opposition to the gospel, which ultimately will have ramifications in all the upheavals among men, including wars. See? Isn't it stupid warfare? Isn't it wicked? It is so wicked. We dress it up with martial music, with uniforms, with medals. We dress it up. What are we dressing up? Cruelty. Unnecessary bloodshed. It is so wicked. The Bible depicts war as being the result of the unlovely heart of man. And it grows out of the rejection of the love of God. Because if you love God, and you know you're loved by God, you've got to love your neighbour. He that loves God, let him love his neighbour. This is the evidence we know God. Please. What about the conquest of Canaan? That's an excellent question. Let me give you a very brief answer. God could have destroyed those wicked people who were putting newborn babies under the foundations of their new houses, who were causing children to walk through the fires to Baal. He could have destroyed them with earthquake or tempest or fire. He chose to do it by the Jews and said to them at the same time, as you'll find in either Leviticus 18 or 19, if you do the things these people do, I'll do the same to you. That was a judgment. Yeah, there is a certain place for war but it's a rare place and it's only when everything else has failed it's just madness if anyone reads the book All Quiet in the Western Front or any of the true records of war and even if you study history you know when World War I was declared the people in London and Berlin and Paris all came out in the streets uproarious with joy and after that, about a million people are killed on the Somme and they don't gain hardly a foot of ground. Isn't it madness? The Iraqis and the people of Iran fight for years, about 15 million are killed. They didn't gain a foot of ground either side. Isn't it madness? See? So if people reject the love of God, the heart becomes very cruel. And this second seal is saying, if you reject the rider on the white horse offering you the gospel... You know, the rainbow symbolism is that of a bow, but with the arrow directed to the heart of God, instead of to us. And this writer has the bow to remind us of the covenant and the rainbow. But if we reject that love, we will become hateful. And it will operate in the church, in the business, in the home, and ultimately among the nations of earth. When that happens, the next step is the gospel seems to be buried. Things become very dark, very black. 
goodness is hard to find. Yet at the same time, God is ministering by His Spirit, the oil and the wine. Still ministers to those who are looking for me, despite the blackness of things. Now they've rejected the gospel. And there's a famine for the Word of God, Amos chapter 8. And wherever there's a famine, the result is pestilence. So the next horse is pestilence. And spiritual pestilence is heresy. Once the gospel is rejected, people will believe all sorts of heresies. The New Age theories are because we live in a post-Christian world. The New Age theories that teach we're all little gods. You know, how can people believe such rubbish? Don't they ever have a cold or diarrhea? Gods? Madness. Absolute madness. But when you reject the gospel, you are prone to all sorts of strange pestilences of the soul. Heresies. So, Seal number one, the gospel going forth. Seal number two, opposition to the gospel that leads to strife, persecutors those that give it. You know, there's a great verse in Mark's gospel that says, there's no one that's forsaken houses or land or brothers or sisters or wife or anything for my sake that won't receive a hundredfold more on this life. And then he says, with persecutions. With persecutions. If I'd been a schema and wanting to invent the Christian religion. I left that out. But it's true. You can't stand up for what's true. Every Christian needs to be a whistleblower. Every evil we could prevent if we spoke up, we are responsible for. The world doesn't like whistleblowers. The church doesn't like whistleblowers. The church is the only army that shoots its own wounded. The church doesn't like them. Business doesn't like them. The government doesn't like them. But every Christian has got to be a whistleblower. Got to protest. But once you protest, you're a marked person. They'll edge you out. So that's seal number two. Opposition to the gospel. Church, family, business, government, the world. Well, once you oppose the gospel, it becomes hard to get. Famine. That's the symbolism of the third horse. Famine. The darkness of the faces of dying, starving people. The weighing out of the grain because it's so precious, hard to find. A famine for the word of God. And yet God's still ministering. Don't hurt the oil, symbol of the spirit, and the wine, the fruitage of the gifts of the spirit. God's still ministering even though it seems covered up. And then when the word is hidden... Disease of the soul, pestilence, the ghastly horse, the pale horse rides forth. Here are the results of resisting the love of God. In other words, the troubles of the world are because we refuse to accept the love of God. Once we accept it, it'd be different. Okay, so you got the horses? Symbolic of the fight over the gospel. Horse, the symbol of warfare. The first one, the symbol of Christ going forth with the gospel through his church. Second, opposition to it, leading to persecution and the sword. And ultimately, in a nation that rejects the gospel, evil hearts, warfare. The third one, the gospel being buried. There's a famine for truth, post-Christian age. And yet God ministers by his spirit, the oil and the wine. The fourth one, if the truth is buried, there'll be all sorts of heresies believed. You know, I've worked in three universities. And there are just about as many stupid things believed in universities as there are in asylums. You know that? I'll tell you the most stupid of all. They teach you how to do everything except how to live. They teach you about everything but God. They'll teach you how to make a bomb but not how to make a life. Isn't that stupid? A world by wisdom knows not God. What was that, uh, Sue Ellen? <laughs> well, when the world rejects God, it, it embraces all the evils of the great antagonist and adversary, the devil himself. Mark? Um, obviously, in the first three chapters of Revelation, we see we can make some parallels to historic view of, of it. When you step, up, step over to these... How far do you think you can take the Remember, historicism at its essence teaches Revelation has a continuing unfolding significance to the church in all ages. That is true. Where historicism is, is it tries to date secular events and attach them to the symbols of Scripture with dates. You can't do that. 
that's the main defect in historicism. So all sorts of dates have been tied to this book, 1798, 1840, August 11, 1844, none of them are biblical. That's the main problem. There's no grounds. The New Testament assumes the end could have come quite quickly. It certainly didn't see there are going to be 2,000 years of delay caused by the unfaith of believers, lack of acceptance of the gospel. Yeah. Right, so these four horses picture what happens in every heart, in every church, in every family, in every country, if the gospel is rejected. It can only lead to all these problems of trouble, persecution, difficulty to find truth, believing in a heresy, death of the soul. And then the scene changes. And the last three are tied with the final events. In the fifth one, you see the, hear the cry of the martyrs, and they say, how long, O Lord? And the answer is, well, more are to be killed yet. That cry, how long, O Lord, is frequent in the Bible. The one that's most well known to many is Daniel 8.13. How long? It's found often in Psalms and often in the prophets. And God's answer is, not yet. Keep resting. It's all symbolism. The saints aren't shut up under a literal altar in heaven. That's symbolic. Their blood cries out like that of Cain, uh, Abel, when Cain slew him. So the blood of the martyr is saying, Lord, when are you going to finish things up? And hasn't every heart felt the same way? You know, you cannot listen to the news without wanting to weep. So much of the world and trouble and pain and anguish. And if they would only believe in the love of God, there couldn't be cruelty. Couldn't be unkindness, see? When we reject the love of God, we reject life. So the fifth one is saying, the cry, how long, O Lord? And the answer is, look, there are more to die yet. The last great tribulation. And this is a very important point. The end cannot come till evil is seen by all heaven and all on earth in its ultimate hideousness. So Abraham was told, you can't have Canaan yet because the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. Jerusalem couldn't fall till the transgressors had come to the full. Revelation 14, the angels cry out to the Lord, come because the halves of the earth is now ripe. Only when the whole world condemns to death the church in its final phase as it offers the gospel of love and mercy and grace, only when the whole world condemns to death the most Christ-like people on earth, then the harvest is ripe. When they begin to murder in the last great tribulation, the final people to offer the gospel, then God says, that's it. So the controversy that symbolically is pictured as beginning with one man and one woman in one place in Eden goes in concentric circles until it takes in the whole world, the gospel will go to the whole world, Matthew 24, 14, will be opposed by the great majority of earth. Those who give the gospel will be condemned to death, Revelation 13, and then God says, that's it. The experiment is over. The evidence is complete for angels and for men. So in the last chapters of the Bible, you'll hear, just and true are thy ways, thou king of saints. Your judgments are made manifest. We understand now what is the fruition of disobedience to you. We see the results of evil. Men become like devils. And we see the results of receiving the gospel. Men and women become like angels in love and kindness and mercy. When I think of my becoming a Christian, it was the kindness of certain people, mainly women, that won me to Christ. Kindness, kindness, kindness. And one great writer said, if we'd humble ourselves before God, be kind and courteous, tender-hearted and pitiful, there'd be a hundred conversions. Well, now there's one. You know, Mother Teresa could do it. Really, Graham does it. See? So that's the fifth seal. How long, Lord? Symbolic. Blood of the martyrs, people saying, why don't you come? I can't come until the ultimate display of evil is made on a worldwide scale. 
when that happens, when the gospel's gone to all the world, the people who give it are condemned to death, that's the end of the demonstration. Then angels and men will declare, just and true are thy ways, thou king of saints. Remember Ephesians 3, 9 and 10. That unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be shown the manifold wisdom of God. We're only a speck in the universe. A speck in the universe. Read Isaiah. We're the small dust of the balance. We're a drop in the bucket. The angels and principalities of unfallen worlds will see in the demonstration that takes down here in the rejection of the cross what evil does and the acceptance of the cross what righteousness does. And then evil will never pop up a second time through all eternity. We'll still be free, but we'll never make this mistake again. We'll have learned from it.